Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle, and today I have the pleasure of having a conversation with Spike Cohen, who is running for vice president of the Libertarian Party. And he is running with Vermin Supreme, who we will talk about. I'm sure many of you has have reservations, but I was on Jess and Chrissy's podcast uh, that uh, I, I didn't know anything about Vermin, and I never heard of Spike. And then I was impressed with both of them, but especially Spike. And he's in a moment where it's it's like a, you know, Larry Sharp in 2016 came along and nobody had ever heard of Larry Sharp. And then everybody was like, dang. And I think, Spike, you're having somewhat of a similar moment. I think that you've impressed a lot of people. And I think our listeners are about to hear why. So, Spike, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who is Spike Cohen? Spike Cohen. I was born at an early age. No. So I, uh, I'm a, hey, everybody, my name is Spike Cohen. I was, uh, I'm a, um business owner who started a web design company uh, in the late 90s in my teens. Uh, I was the uh, I started, uh, owned and operated and grew that company into a fairly, fairly decent sized company and then sold it three years ago so that I could focus my life on my real passion, which is spreading the message of liberty to a public that often hasn't heard of things like self-ownership, non-aggression, property rights, voluntary solutions. They haven't heard these things. That's not part of the, the cultural conversation that's happening. What they're hearing is a bunch of people arguing over how much more government should grow, how much more involved in your life uh, the state should be, how many uh, you know fewer choices you should have, and, 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 and so forth. And so uh, that culminated in my becoming the uh, host of uh, my fellow Americans, the co-host of the Muddy Waters of Freedom, and the co-owner of Muddy Waters Media. Uh, late last year, I uh, announced that I was running as uh, Vermin Supreme's running mate uh, to run for the Libertarian Party vice presidential nomination, uh, which is essentially doing the same thing that I've been doing, using entertainment as a means to bring people into the Libertarian movement and the Libertarian Party uh, with the goal of, uh, of, of, of broadening our message and broadening not by watering down our message or by sacrificing any of our core beliefs or tenets, but by simply presenting our message in an entertaining, empathetic, dynamic, and engaging way to a public that innately knows that something is wrong, that no matter what government tells them, what major media tells them that everything's fine, just listen to us and do what we say and, and, and everything will be okay. They innately know that not to be true, but no one's signaling back to them that that's true. And so that's why I'm running to give a voice to uh, people to be able to know that that is correct and to explain to them why that's the case. So let's go back to Baby Spike. I, that is your real name. Uh, it's but, not. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. I, I saw a post that was funny that you <laughs> declared your name Spike and made everyone call you that. Right. Yeah. Um, so did you grow up in a political household? Like where, when did you decide that you might be a libertarian? I mean, have some people are, I, I was a Republican and then I came from a Republican family. I right. converted to libertarianism, you know, in 2007. Uh, do, did you grow up in a, in a political household? And when did you start to realize that mm, I may be a libertarian and what, what's your origin story? So interestingly enough, I was raised in somewhat of a, I guess, liberty leaning Republican, household or i guess maybe conservative household so like a liberty leaning conservative household and i actually rebelled for a while by becoming a neocon uh, especially after 9 11 and the run-up to the iraq war and everything i bought into the entire uh right-wing media hype uh about you know that yeah you know, that we needed to spread democracy and freedom around the world and that the terrorists hated us for our freedoms that we needed to fight against islamo fascism and all of that nonsense and and uh so i was very much into that and then over time, I kind of uh, think thankfully there were some liberty leaning people who were actually willing to engage me uh, instead of calling me a bootlicker or, you know, uh, uh, you know, a cop sucker or whatever. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, made a point of, of actually, you know, engaging with me on the Internet about these things and talking with me on the phone about these things. And that encouraged me to research further what I believed. And, and the more research I did, the more I went from being a sort of a neocon to, I guess, kind of a constitutionalist. Uh, to a, a paleocon slash minarchist, uh, and then eventually to sort of a, a, a libertarian. And now I'm, I'm more sort of on the radical, like anarchy side of libertarianism. Um, but that's, uh, but no, uh, starting off uh, very much in a, in a 
Republic, uh, liberty leaning conservative household. So my parents voted for Ross Perot in 92 uh, because, you know, Bush wasn't, you know, Bush raised taxes. So like that kind of that kind of household, they were fine with being the ones who who voted for Perot and, and didn't see uh, Bill Clinton as being any better than uh, George Bush. Um, so that that was sort of the household I was raised in. I was also raised in, uh, I am Jewish, uh, and my father is a, a retired rabbi. And he actually made a point of, you know, telling me that, you know, we need guns. And he would talk about things like the Holocaust and the pogroms and everything. And he would say, you know, if things get bad, we potentially could be the only ones who can defend ourselves. And, you know, we may have friends who will help us, but it, there have been times when things have turned really, really bad, very, very quickly. And so we need to be able to defend ourselves. So very, very pro gun household my entire life. And uh, so, I mean, even when I was a hardcore neocon and I would see some of the neocons who were, you know, in favor of gun controls and stuff. And I'm like, no, no restrictions whatsoever that I've always been straight up hardcore libertarian on the gun issue, uh, even in my worst times. Yeah, that's interesting. So uh, I'll ask a delicate question. You don't seem to mind those. Um, as as a person of you know Jewish heritage and faith, I don't I don't know what you're you know that's the the two are not mutually exclusive. It seems. Mm -hmm. um, I find that there are elements in the libertarian movement, especially on the more radical ends, that if if you dig if you scratch the end the Fed stuff sometimes too hard with some people. <laughs> You end up back at the Rothschilds and the Drew Jews control everything. Right, right, right. Um, I, you know, I haven't, I haven't ever thought about that, like in terms of the pogroms and the Holocaust, and we need mm -hmm. the Second Amendment to protect ourselves from that. That's a very libertarian leaning aspect that developed out of that. Yep. I mean, how, how do you deal with people when you kind of run against that anti-Semitic grain within the libertarian movement? Or do you agree that that exists? I mean, maybe I'm just overly sensitive. Oh, it absolutely yeah. exists. Uh, here's the thing. Any, any movement that maximizes human freedom is going to attract some scummy people because <laughs> the signal they're getting is, oh, I can be free to be as scummy as I want to be, <laughs> right? So now, and that's true. You are free to be as scummy as you want to be. What they don't get is that in a truly free society, yeah, they'll be scummy and everyone else is going to voluntarily disassociate from them and they're going to be in an even lonelier position than they are currently where people are kind of forced to associate with them. So it's actually not going to work out for them, but but that's the signal they get. When they hear freedom, they, they think, well, freedom to be an asshole freedom. I'm sorry. Can I swear on this? Yes, you can swear. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Freedom to be a jerk and freedom to be anti-Semitic, freedom to be racist, bigoted, whatever. And again, that's true to an extent, but I think the correction of the fact that the vast majority of people aren't going to be that and are going to disassociate from people like that will, will correct that kind of thing. But all that to say that, you know, yes, when you get into, for example, ending the Fed and ending the central banks. That's going to attract the people who want to end the central banks because they associate central banks with Jews. Uh, when you talk about, for example, bodily autonomy, you know, we've attracted a lot of people that are very much against circumcision uh, because they see it as, you know, a, a violation of the, the the child's bodily autonomy rights, which that's certainly a conversation to be had. And I, I respect people's opinions on that. But anything that says uh, circumcision shouldn't be allowed is going to attract people that are against circumcision because it's a Jewish thing and they think that it's a way for the Jews to steal our our penises or whatever. I mean so so this is, you know, it, it's <laughs> valuable these, possessions. All of, yeah, exactly. This these are like some odd pipelines that it could go to some weird places where you're like, yeah, I like bodily autonomy. Hey, why are all these Nazis here? But so no, that's not the movement, but any movement that talks about freedom is going to associate people who want to be free to be scumbags. Any movement that talks about ending, you know, centralized power is going to attract people who associate centralized power with some demographic group they don't like. So yeah, that's, that's just and that's sort of happening right now with the pandemic stuff. You yes. get you share some information and the next thing you know, you're being swarmed with anti-vax people, which if you're pro-vax, anti-vax, I don't care. Like we yep. can all be friends. Um, and have that discussion. I think it's a discussion worth having uh, yeah. with rationality and l less emotion. Um, but it, it is funny where you, you're you like, you see the pandemic thing and then you scratch that person a little bit further and then you're like, oh, whoa, wait a minute. Where? Uh oh. Hey, Malice's quote about take one red pill, not the whole bottle is just, I think that. <laughs> 
that's such a great warning for new libertarians. Like it's like when I first converted to Christianity, I immediately veered right into the end times and the left behind theories and, you know, Bill Clinton, seven Hills and Christ. Yes. And all of a sudden it's, you know, you go, Whoa, okay. All right. It's, it's really just about treating people nicely. And, and, and new libertarians, it's, it is almost like a conversion thing there where new, the newer libertarians are always more zealous and they're of course, always find the secret knowledge of being whatever belief system they're in. So yeah, take, take one red pill, not the whole bottle. It, it's like a Dunning Kruger thing, right? So it's like, I'm going to become the most libertarian. Per- oh, oh no, I'm people don't like me anymore. And maybe I should rethink some of these things. And then over time you're like, you know what, actually I am, you know, I do believe in our precepts and our principles, but I don't want to go in a weird path on it. Right. So yeah. that, that is sort of what it, there's sort of that natural progression there. Um, perfect example, uh, the, the vaccine thing I am against, I, I tend to generally believe the scientific consensus that vaccines are good. There, there may be ones that aren't, you know, helpful or ones that are being pushed by big pharma. I think, you know, there's been some, some, some potential evidence that the, the, I think Gardasil vaccine for, um, for, um, there's HPV, vaccine, you yeah, know, nation course for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so I, I, I get, I get that, but at the end of the day, here's the thing. No one should force you to put anything inside your body. Bottom right. line. So I am against forced vaccination. Um, but what happens is when you signal, I, when you say I'm against forced vaccination, that will bring in people who are pro vaccine, but just don't think people should, you know, have to be forced to take it. It will also bring in people who don't like the vaccines, but generally they they agree with the scientific consensus. It'll bring in people who think that this is all just the five G towers and and or chemtrails or whatever. It's going to bring all sorts of different people, and that's okay because we are a movement of freedom, and people are free to believe what they what they want. Uh, but we often need to make sure we're not losing the forest for the trees. We need to not allow the people who are not using uh, a level of, of reason to determine their 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 belief system. Uh, and, and we also need to influence them to help kind of bring them more into the fold of like, OK, but let's be rational. Like we're not we're not saying that it's 5G towers that are making us sick. Um, be, but also at the same time, we need to make sure that we are putting our voice out there as being reasonable and that this is about consent and about ending coercion. This isn't about blaming the problems on the Jews or, you know, blaming problems on the fact that airplanes leave uh, uh, condensation trails behind them when they when they fly in the stratosphere. You know, like th- this kind of stuff, we just have to be, you know, we have to be mindful of that. But that's not the movement. It's just that's that's what a a, a type of thing like this will attract. Yeah. And, and so one one thing that I really appreciated about the Vermin Spike campaign is that you do attract more radical elements of the movement. Mm-hmm. And let me define some terms because I would consider myself more pragmatic and maybe you more radical. And mm-hmm. uh, so we say these things. And what, what I don't appreciate about certain strains or certain campaigns, to be quite honest, is almost this idea of orthodoxy versus heresy. If you're with us, you're either with us or you're against us. Right. You know, uh, when Justin Amash gets in the race, he's not a real libertarian. He's too, you know, he believes these things. It's happening to Judge Jim Gray with jury, jury nullification. Man has a, a a multi-layered view of jury nullification because he's an, a judge. He has more knowledge about this than you and me because he's a judge. And his nuanced answer got turned into... He's a heretic. Burn him at the stake. He doesn't believe in jury nullification. It, it, and it's almost like the Bill Weld, Hillary Clinton comments where he was saying Hillary Clinton is a serious person. And that has turned into four years later, he endorsed Hillary Clinton, which is not what he said. And so it's even though Bill Weld sucks, it's like, don't lie about the guy. And so what what I don't when I hear the the argument between pragmatists and radicals in the LP, I don't think there's anybody who would look at. Like I look at Adam Kokesh's localism plan, and that's probably the closest thing to what I personally believe. That's right. my end goal. That's where I want to get. But I have worked in politics long enough that I have these serious series of steps that I want to get to, you know, because the population at large isn't just going to adopt a radically new belief system. But I appreciate that there are people like Adam Kokesh or yourself or you know, other quote unquote radicals that are willing to make that their messaging strategy of here's the end goal. Here's the destination that we're here. Here's the uh, destination that we're trying to get to. 
versus you need a Judge Jim Gray, you need a Justin Amash to lay out the policy plans to get there, the directional libertarian who's saying, here's where we're at and here's where we need to go to get to this endpoint. And so the conversation, I think, is like pure versus impure. And that, I think, is a fair, an unfair categorization. And as a person who likes Gary Johnson, who liked Bob Barr at the time, like I'm tired of being beat up by quote unquote radicals for liking people that I that have a similar messaging strategy that I do. And it just it sort of becomes unfair uh, and um, unkind and irresponsible in a certain way, because you're not allowed to have those nuanced discussions of I need we need to do this or this is how I think about it, because you we slip into heresy versus orthodoxy. What I like about your campaign is that when Amash got in, you guys didn't engage in that. You said, we're going to go all in on what we believe. We're not going to attack this guy. We're not going to do a seven-step video of why this is the worst person on the planet to try and introduce that unfair strategy. If you're trying to tear down another candidate to win, then you know, you're know you left with very little once they leave the race. And then all of a sudden you're like, shit, I got to figure out what I what I believe. Right, and, right. and you guys haven't done that. And I really do appreciate that because as a person who was an Amash fan, I think it was noticed by those of us who are on a diff of a different stripe, you know, that you're willing to say, here's what I believe and here's what I'm about and you can get on board or not. Right. Yeah. So when, and just to be clear, so when Justin Amash got in um, to the race, I did do some appearances where people asked me my opinion about Amash and I, I, I gave my concerns and, and why I didn't think he was the right pick. But I think that there's a difference be between that and trying to kick him out of the party or say that people who support him are, you know, not real libertarians and things like that. First of all, that's just terrible messaging. If you as a, you know, more pragmatic person and me as a more radical person, if I'm hoping to uh, influence you over time into being more on the radical side, or at least being understandable and amenable to our our goals and our strategies and and our our thoughts on on how to move forward as a party and as a movement. The absolute worst way to do that is to try to make you feel like a bad person for disagreeing with me. That's not a good way to do it because then even if I make good points, you are going to reflexively reject what I say. That just a natural thing. If I've attacked You're you, the English Reformation and the Spanish Inquisition is the worst way to get people to convert to your way of thinking. Turns out, yes, I might be able to get you. Like, I mean, if I went full Spanish Inquisition, actually forced you at sword point to join, yeah, sure, you might join, but you're still going to be a prag on the side when no one's looking. So, and 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 since I can't physically force you to do it, nor would I want to, really, all I'm going to do is just turn you off to anything I have to say. And and there's something to be said about how libertarians interact. Uh, with the greater body politic in general with that. But within libertarianism, uh, this circular firing squad thing, I, I've never been a fan of it. And 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 I, I say that as someone that often in getting in these heated, especially when you're on social media, the two things that are very helpful when interacting with people on social media, pretend that they're in front of you because they are in, in reality, in, in terms of their brain and your brain interacting with each other, you are in front of each other. Pretend they're in front of you. Pretend that everyone you know and care about is watching because they potentially could be as well as a bunch of other people you don't know. Pretend that you're talking to someone who used to not believe what you believe. Pretend you're talking to yourself back when you didn't believe what you believe because you essentially are. You're talking to someone who isn't where you are yet. Those three filters, if you put through how you talk to people, when you get in these heated political discussions, you know, remember you're talking to a person. Uh, pretend they're in front of you, pretend you're actually having a face-to-face -face conversation, pretend everyone's watching, everyone you care about and a bunch of other people, uh, and pretend that, you know, you're talking to yourself uh, that, you know, is, isn't quite where you are, you know, back when you weren't quite where you are in your now pinnacle of belief that you've reached in this very moment uh, with nothing else to ever learn in, in life again. Pretend that, that those three things, and that will go a long way in how you interact with others. Um, and that's, you know, at the times when I get very, very heated, I have found that, you know, actually forcing myself to go through those filters has been incredibly helpful to the point now where I, I don't really engage that way anymore. Um, but so in terms of strategy, for me to talk to you that way or to interact with you that way, uh, especially when we're already such a small group to begin with, to try to constantly whittle down to the, the absolute most pure, you know, aged beef part of libertarian, it, it, you know, you're making something that's so small and diminutive and has already created burn so many bridges that you're not going to get anywhere. Now, I, I have to say, because you triggered me a couple times with a few of those things, uh, uh, with the Bill Weld thing, he did not say I endorse Hillary Clinton, 
but he absolutely did go on major media and say things like, you know, if you aren't considering voting third party, you should vote for Hillary Clinton. And here are all the reasons why Donald Trump is a terrible candidate. And here's the, here's the problem with that. When you're already a small third party and you're talking to voters who are strategic, almost all voters are strategic voters. When you keep telling them that this other option that has a much greater chance of winning is really a good option. It's not a bad option and it's way better than this other option that also has a really good chance of winning and that you in the middle are the best option, but have almost no chance of winning. What the strategic voter is hearing is don't vote for me, vote for this option. That's yeah, the- there's no doubt that Bill Weldon yeah. on every single, in almost every single way was he had no loyalty to the movement. He had no loyalty to the party. He had no loyalty to the ideology. He didn't understand the ideology. He didn't understand us. He didn't, and he didn't care, you know, like uh, I'll give Kokesh credit because he first kind of went after him, but then got to talking to the guy and helped kind of move him more towards our way of thinking. But there's no doubt that Weld sucked like, uh, and, and was just a, you know, judge Jim gray as a running mate was infinitely better than, Weld as a running mate when you compare those 2012 and 2016 yes. can, campaigns, like yep. Weld, it, 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 I think from the Prague side, it's it's like it was disappointing having to feel like you need to defend those campaigns, and so I totally understand where a lot of people in this campaign, when Amash gets in, people on the non Prague side are looking at at it, going, okay, you supported Bob Barr, you supported Wayne Allen Root, you supported Gary Johnson, you supported Bill Weld. Why should we trust Justin Amash? Why should we trust your opinion anymore? Like that's a very rational way of thinking. He, 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 even though Justin Amash is not Bill Weld, I mean he that's that's Bill yeah, Weld. he's not Bill Weld, and I, I say that as someone that you know Amash was obviously not my pick. I, he wouldn't have been my second pick either. Um, and there is something to be said about the fact that I think at this point, uh, I think we should we should reject the idea that the only way we can become legitimate is to bring in someone from the Republicrats. If we are even if they're very principled and they agree with us 70, 80 percent of the time, I want to bring them in like let's bring them in have them join the party let them even run for re-election where they are but the idea that if we keep presenting if we keep telling everyone that the way to grow at the get to the top of the libertarian party is to use the cheat code of running as a republican or a democrat really as a republican and spending a, a few years there and building up legitimacy by having been elected as a republican which is obviously easier to do than run than winning as a libertarian. And then once you've done that for a while, then you can jump back to the libertarian party when you want to take one last old tilt at the old windmill and run for president. Then the problem with that is that what you are telling the entirety of the libertarian party membership is you are wasting your time by working your way up in the libertarian party because we want a Republican. That's mm-hmm. how we're going to become legitimate. And you are signaling to literally everyone else who's paying attention. We only find ourselves legitimate when we bring in Republicans. And if and if they're not paying that much attention, really what they're hearing is we're basically Republicans that are kind of edgy and like weed and, you know, like guns more or whatever. And, and that's not a good look for branding. It's not a good look for morale. It's not a good look for strategy. So that was my concern about specifically about Amash just coming in and jumping right to the top of the ticket. I hope he's going to run for reelection as a congressman. And I and we will fully, and I, you know, I recently posted, I said, were you torn, be, torn before be, between Amash uh, Amash and Vermin. Well, now you don't have to be. You can support Vermin and you can support Amash, and we're going to be there 100 percent if he uh, supporting him if he runs for you know re-election as a libertarian. And in 2024, if he's been doing the libertarian stuff and he you know, you know whether he gets reelected or not, then we can have a different conversation. If he stayed in the party and he's you know you know helped us and 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 done the things that we're doing to try to help grow the party, going on campus tours like I've been doing, going and knocking on, on doors and housing projects like I've been doing, all of that stuff, and you've shown that yeah, you're really here for the party we'll have a completely different conversation but we have to stop this thing of like oh okay you're oh you're an elected official and you want to jump to the top of the party that's great yeah everyone else uh you all wasted your time uh turns out you should have run as a republican that that's we have to stop break that cycle that's going to be a big start of it i i I agree with what you're saying but i also see amash as a different case where you know amash is very much like ron paul 88 where paul had lost his seat basically in a primary because he wasn't Ronald Reagan supportive enough, a very popular Republican president that everybody thought was libertarian and he wasn't. And so everybody, you know, he left Congress, ran uh, as a libertarian. What I, what I hated was like trying to 
paint Justin Amash as Bob Barr or Bill Weld because you're right. He no, no, he wasn't. No, and that's yeah, and he definitely right. was not that. Well, and, and again, this isn't about Amash as much as what we are signaling to ourselves and others by sure. continuing to do. But you're, but you're right. He's here's, definitely here's not. That. Well, here's the signal to everyone else, and I asked this specifically. And I'm sorry to Chrissy Wickers because I pissed her off by stealing her question, but this was a very important strategic question that I had at the end of that conversation with Amash on the Chrissy and Jess show. Mm -hmm. And because when I was executive director in Indiana from 8 to 12, that's the, the Ron Paul campaign era, and you had all these Republicans that were big Amash fans and Amash himself and Campaign for Liberty and Young Americans for Liberty and all these people. Mm -hmm told me you're wasting your time, become a Republican, change it from the inside. And Justin Amash is a very clear signal that you cannot change it from the inside. There is no virtue in being a Republican or a Democrat if you are a libertarian. And That's Justin Amash, when I, asked, yeah. when, I, when I said, like, can you change it from the inside? And he said, clearly, no. Go back and listen to that answer, because that is a very clear signal to all libertarians of all ideologies to if you're going to if if you're under the delusion that you can get elected to Congress and in assert authority and change it from the inside, you're not going to. You're not going to. No. And so you're probably better off. I've always been a third party person. That's I was a big Ross Perot fan. Uh, you know, if I if I knew who John Anderson was at the time, I would have voted for that guy too. You know, and so I've always been a third party person because I was a reporter as a as a young young and and i saw how corrupt both parties were and amash sends a signal to all libertarians that you're wasting your time if you're anywhere else the problem is are you wasting your time as a libertarian <laughs> and I, I would say no i think that on the local level i've seen so many campaigns you know rupert for governor for instance rupert from survivor ran here in 2012 and mm -hmm. won several of his policy points were adopted by Mike Pence when he became governor, which is a win. That is a type of win. Yes. Yes. Because they tested it and then they started running ads on increasing vocational education. Yep. And so, so, and so a part of our conversation, and I don't want to belabor too many of the points that we had, I would encourage people to go back and listen to my conversation with Vermin and Spike on the Chrissy and Jess show. Uh, it's in our podcast feed. Um, the ver the uh of uh, what do we call it this the um spike and vermi, spike and vermi easter special with yeah. vermin and spike yeah and uh i thought you both were very articulate about a lot of the things that you believe but one thing i pressed you on that i think my audience has a, a an, an issue with is what we dealt with on the rupert campaign he's got a big beard he's wearing tie-dye he was on survivor yeah, yeah, How yeah can anybody ever take this person seriously he's not a smart person you know he, he because he was on tv uh, how did you, you, you seem very intelligent and very bright. How did you fall into a campaign with a man wearing a boot on his head? What is you, wrong with you? Are you, you, you seem normal. Why are, what's wrong with you? It's funny. I had a t conversation with Hody Johns who just endorsed us. I'm name dropping now. Yes. Uh, Hody Johns, uh, who's with, we are libertarians. Certainly mm -hmm. didn't do it on behalf of, we are libertarians, but he Correct. is a part of, we are libertarians as is Ryan Lindsay. Uh, the editor in chief of the Heretic, which is the uh, uh, which is the We Are Libertarians podcast or uh, newsletter, our also endorsed. Yep, we're we're working our way up. We're 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 working <laughs> our way up the the We Are Libertarians ladder until we've achieved peak uh, saturation. But so no, so talking with Hody, he said, you know, initially, you know, I liked you, I was following you, I was really into you, and then then you became Vermin's running mate, and I started second guessing all of my my ways of judging people's characters. And, 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 and so, so here's the thing. A year ago today, really up until this last summer, I've been following Vermin since like 08 or 20, either 20, either 08 or 2012. I forget which cycle I first saw him. And I'm like, this is perfect. This is hilarious. Uh, in 2016, big fan. Um, and, but when I found out last year that he was actually running for serious as the libertarian, you know, for the libertarian nomination and had a campaign team and everything else, I thought, uh oh, I don't know what I think about this. Like, I don't know if this is a good idea. I think he's a good guy. And I totally, like, I was in on the joke. I got it. Like, I, I totally got that. But I'm like, but is he the right pick for us? I, I don't know. And, but I had a lot of people that I respected who were on his campaign team and who were vouching for him and saying, you know what, he's our guy, or he may not be, you know, my top pick, but he's one of my top picks. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. And so I spent time on why that is. And I realized something. First of all, 
there's an entire generation of voters who have grown up watching him and whose poli sci professors have been talking about him. And they have a completely different concept of vermin than we do. They see the boot and the ponies and everything else. And they don't think, how oh, that's a funny shtick. They think this speaks to me. I find this less silly than the other people who are also basically just pretending to have authority and uh, making a bunch of promises that they're never going to keep and that we all know they're not going to keep, but no one can say that we're supposed to pretend they're definitely going to keep them this time. And yet here's someone who's just doing the exact same thing, but in a silly way. And we're, and, 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 and they, they intuitively get it and they love him, which is why if you go on Twitter right now and type in vermin Supreme, uh, you're going to find an endless stream of people saying, I'm voting for Vermin Supreme. I'm supporting Vermin Supreme. I'm not a libertarian, but I want Vermin Supreme. I, you know, if Vermin Supreme is not on the ballot, I'm going to write him in. I was a Bernie supporter. I'm, I like Vermin Supreme. I was a Yang supporter. I like Vermin Supreme. Look, endless. It's endless. And anytime I've gone anywhere with him, he gets mobbed. And he increasingly now gets mobbed even, even if he's not wearing the boot because people are now recognizing him from all of his appearances without, without a boot. Um, but so... The whole point of that is that, and we call it boot pilling. The concept of, of how this works is that we have a situation as third party candidates that the media has set a trap for us every single election cycle. They tell us if you put up a respectable candidate, one who's not too out there and who presents himself in a very you know respectful way and gives nice, agreeable, possibly even passive interviews and just you know uh, answers the questions the way that they want that we want them to, we'll give you a seat at the table this time and you'll be taken seriously. And every single time we do that. And it blows up in our faces because that was a trap. They have no intention of giving us a seat at the table. When we show up and do the passive interviews and act all respectful and respectable and answer all, answer all the questions the way they want, all they do is ask us a bunch of gotcha questions and they twist our words. And if we screw up one time, they say, ha, he said, what is Aleppo? Gary Johnson gave in, in that interview on MSNBC where he's literally being grilled by multiple people on live TV with gotcha questions, did a great job, but he messed up once. And he didn't even mess up. He just didn't know what Aleppo was. And when they told, after going, oh, you don't know what Aleppo is? And then they told him what Aleppo was. He gave a great answer about that. And he then libertarians great... spend four years amplifying that, which is well, the craziest thing to me because stupid libertarians mention Aleppo all the time. It's like, if you'd let it go and actually started pointing out the positives of Gary Johnson, people probably have a better opinion of Gary Johnson. He, and gave, a, he, in general. Yeah. he gave a great right. answer about yeah. Aleppo. Once it was told to him what Aleppo was, because God forbid this man not have encyclopedic knowledge of every single thing. Now, it was a big thing happening and he probably should have known what Aleppo was. Whatever. I, I think it's... What excuse was he was confused or he didn't hear correctly and he was asking what he, they were talking about or, even if he didn't yeah. know what it, even if he didn't know what the name aleppo was once they told him what it was he answered it and you know what they did they told everyone he was a joke and that you know he had no idea what he was talking about and they the signal that they sent was this guy is not serious he has no idea what he's talking about he's a joke don't take him seriously you have to vote democrat or republican and How that's what they do in how many gaps did Donald Trump get on a daily basis? Exactly. For one from Gary Johnson. Exactly. Exactly. And that's the point. You cannot play their game. We are Charlie Brown to their Lucy with the football every single damn cycle. What Vermin does is he completely subverts that. You can't try to get a gotcha on a man who's already treating the entire thing like a joke, who's treating them like part of the joke, who's making them the punchline, who's making them regret that they have to even bring him on, but they have to bring him on. Here's the other part of that. They have to bring him on because media, especially TV media, is a dying medium. They need ad revenue. They need attention and vermin gets attention. So as much as they hate in the same way that they hated Donald Trump, but they had to cover Donald Trump because he got so much attention, they will have to cover vermin. They do have to cover vermin as much as they hate it, as much as he is exposing their entire fraud for what it is. They have to bring him on. You know, the other thing he does is that people tune in. They get he gets their attention and they're entertained. They don't feel like someone's about to tell them something that's going to challenge their belief system and they, their cognitive defenses are way up and they're they're ready to fight back in their brains and say, no, no, you're wrong. I'm a Republican. I'm a Democrat. They're being entertained. They're they're finding this funny. They hate the media too. Everyone almost everyone hates the media. They love watching these reporters get flustered over all of this, and they get innately all of the 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 the, the allegories of what he's pro. But you know, I'm another politician promising you a bunch of stuff that I'm never going to follow through on. That's part of the joke, and they get it. 
And now you've lowered their cognitive defenses. You have them want to find out more, and then you can actually hit them with the serious thing. You have their attention. They are engaged. They are not defensive. They want to know more. They are actually engaging you to find out more, and now you can hit them with it. That is how boot pilling works. And it's why we won the Libertarian Presidential Recruitment Competition in April. Back in April, last month, we had a presidential recruitment competition, which was partially our idea. We went to the LP and said, hey, we'd like to actually have a, a, a gauge to measure how many people we're bringing into the party because people are saying we aren't bringing people into the party. You know what it showed? Vermin Supreme and I brought more than double, uh, brought, brought almost, a, almost double the number of new recruits to the Libertarian Party as every other presidential candidate combined. And we've been doing that every single month. And the reason we've been doing that every single month is because we are doing a level of engagement outside of libertarian circles, even as we are trying to signal inwards within the libertarian party, you know, do delegate service to pick us. We are still able to reach outside of libertarian circles and bring people in with a good hearted, good natured, uh, humorous and satirical approach that has a serious edge to it of how we message libertarianism. And it is working. Yeah. So the uh, the tagline for We Are Libertarians since 2012 has been all the irreverence modern politics deserves. And right. we use we employ the same tactics. We, you know, we're, we're less of a comedy excuse me, we're less of a comedy show than we were in 2016, but we're still unprofessional as evidenced by me belching into the microphone. <laughs> um, you know, we used memes as people early on when we, because every libertarian outlets to shares memes now, but when we started doing it in 2013, 2014, no one else was doing so much it. shit from people. Nobody else was doing it. And everybody was like, you guys are unprofessional. You look like jokes. You're just being ludicrous. You need to you need to play the standard commentary game. You need to act like Bill Crystal. And now everybody's doing what we were doing. Everyone's doing it. Everyone is, you know, I'm much less of a joke to people than I was back then. Uh, and, and so I do get it. And, and I have seen our path and the acceptance of We Are Libertarians in much the same way as you. Like people didn't get it especially 2015, 2016, when I was just, you know, I'm fairly alienated from my own state party at this point. Uh, and <laughs> because uh, you memed, because you memed your way onto the internet, which yeah. is now standard issue. That's what you do. You have to use memes now. Everyone's somebody, using memes now. Somebody recently said in a group who drinks sour, or eats sour grapes by the pound was like, well, you know, just, just like when people confuse the Libertarian Party of Indiana with uh, we are libertarians. It's like, yeah, I wouldn't want them to confuse a national organization with thousands of dollars a month coming in and hundreds of listeners, thousands of listeners. It's, you just go. God forbid they associate an incredibly popular and growing thing with this, you know, with this, this state affiliate for, for, for a, a third party. Yeah. And so, you know, you do, you take your shit, you take your lumps, you know, it's all about you and it, and yeah, it is somewhat all about me. Um, but at the end of the day, I've learned that humor brings down people's defenses and so yep. so i do totally co-sign on that strategy um and this is the closest you're going to get to an endorsement from the head of the we are libertarians network because i do like to remain neutral this is an endorsement uh, uh i cannot imagine and i do not know anybody that is excited about a joe jorgensen candidacy now i'm sure she is a very very nice woman. I have not yeah. talked to her. Yes. No, she is absolutely. I've met her a handful of times now. She's a very, very nice lady. Yes. And everybody that I know that is around her, that is on her campaign, people, great people like Joe Houtman yep. speaks so highly of her. Steve but, Dotsbach. Yep. Yep. And so Jorgensen, based on a delegate poll, a pretty solid poll, wins in the 10th round of voting. And that is a great example of the thousand delegates who are made up of people who have been in the party for. 30, 20, 10 years yep, yep. who have worked with her. She was a former vice presidential candidate. Mm -hmm. You know, they know her, they trust her, they believe in her. And so they're putting her up because of organizational trust. They're not thinking about the average libertarian who wants to promote a libertarian party campaign. And it's not going to be Joe Jorgensen. I, I'm sorry. Like there isn't anything in me that says, I want to use what I've built here to promote Joe Jorgensen because there's just, I don't have a bad opinion. I don't have a good opinion. I don't have an opinion. You know, it's like, I'd forget that she's there and that's, what's going to happen if she's the nominee. And I feel that way about 
sort of Judge Jim Gray, who I probably would vote for if I were a delegate or a member of the party. Hornberger is one of those people where it is like a Ron Paul thing where he's going to activate people who are already libertarians but don't know it. But like, oh, well, like he, he again, you're going to go promote him. Adam Kokesh, we're not going to get into. Um, but Vermin is, and the people that I have talked to, Vermin is the only one in my circle where people are like, yeah, I'd share that because I want to be in on the joke. It will be fun. It will be an entertaining thing. And so the grassroots libertarians are, are you're the only campaign at this point that's exciting people. Like once a mosh left, I was just like, I don't care which one of these people wins because I'm not, I'm not going to fuck with it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yep. maybe that's bad on me, but I just, you know, it's like I've got other stuff that I've got to worry about. And I think there are a lot of uh, adults that are going to feel the same way. So uh, I'm not going to ask you to talk bad about any of your fellow people, but I will right. say that is the, that is the case for the vermin Supreme campaign is that in me just kind of anecdotally testing the people that I know, the dozens of people that I've kind of talked to about who, who are you supporting? Mm -hmm. Vermin is the only one that actually brings any excitement. And even if they are gray delegates or Kokesh or Hornberger people, they're like, yeah, I'm okay with Vermin. He yep. has he has managed over the course of the last two or three months through all the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of debates that have been... <laughs> <laughs> the literally thousands of debates. That right. have been, yeah. He has managed to make people like me go from absolutely fucking not yeah. to, all right, I get it now. To you absolutely know. fucking maybe. <laughs> but there's a possibility. There's a possibility. Just the maybe the tip. Just maybe the tip of the of the boot. Listen, by the way, everyone, th that was uh, an endorsement by Chris, and no one will convince me otherwise, least of all Chris. Um, <laughs> but uh, so he here's the thing I want to say uh, about the because I, I, I don't badmouth other candidates and, and everything. Joe's a, a, a great person, and she is absolutely a libertarian. And she has great policies. I don't agree with all of them, but I, I agree largely. Uh, Jim Gray, I don't know as well, but he seems libertarian. I, I think I disagree with him on things like UBI and a national sales tax, for example. But I, I think he's a good candidate. Um, uh, uh, Jacob Hornberger is, a, I, I believe, a good candidate. I know, I know, Chris and I may disagree on that. I, and I, I think he's. No, he's I like a, I like Hornberger. I'm, I have not like Hornberger was my first choice, and then okay. when he decided to make his campaign about a mosh. I started to question my like my own sanity. Yeah. Like, what? And then you find out about his history with Harry Brown, and you're just like, all right, well, this is like, he, so. But he impressed me in the debate that we put on with Matt Welch. You know, he's fundamentally solid. Like he's solid. Know. He's articulate. Yeah. He can he exactly. can he can do all of this. And listen, and I, I have to say, I like Jacob personally, and I knocked on doors side by side with him in housing projects. He's the real deal. He's serious about what he's doing. I and, totally uh, agree with you. Yes. Yeah. So I, I I don't have anything to say, and I don't really have you know I have policy disagreements that I have with some of them. Uh, and I but you know I don't have anything negative to say about Jacob. Here is why I am a vermin supporter. He is as libertarian as any of them. He is largely as good at articulating libertarianism as any of them. No one else is going to be able to spark a flame of interest in the cultural, in the greater body, body politic, in the in the general public like Vermin is. It's not even close. It's he is on orders of magnitude higher in terms of a level of engagement. We put out two ads, a one and a half minute ad featuring me. Uh, and a one minute ad that was just with Vermin. Uh, we put those ads out. Uh, the one just with Vermin was put out, I think, four days ago. And the one that was put out with me was put out two days ago. The one that was put out with just Vermin four days ago is well over 150,000 views at this point combined on different social media. And the, and mine is well over 50,000 at this point. I think we're, we're, we're approaching, we're, I think we may be over 60,000 at this point. There were just ads we put out on our social media. We didn't boost them. We didn't, you know, uh, pay for advertising or anything else. They were engaging ads and they had a, a very powerful message in them. And I encourage people to, uh, to look for, uh, to look for the ads, uh, on any of our uh, platforms that one is called you are the power. And the other one is called now is the time. And they are short, snappy, uh, uh, fun. In fact, they're, they're, they're fun and, and not even really funny, but just fun and engaging ads. In fact, mine's actually pretty serious. And, um, the point is that no other candidate can get that kind of viewership without having to pay for it. And even if they pay for it, they probably won't get that same level of viewership because we are affecting the cultural conversation even before we get the nomination on a level that none of the other candidates can. And we are 
presenting a non-watered down, non, uh, you know, some would call it milk toast, but a, a non-watered down, non-half measure. Uh, uh, we're not having to sacrifice any of our principles or beliefs. We're not having to take a, 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 you know, careful approach to how we are presenting libertarianism because we present libertarianism in an entertaining way. So we lower those defenses. We can hit them with the entire thing. You know, you're ready for the tip of the boot. They want the entire boot. They're already ready for the entire boot because they are entertained by it. They want to find out more. They are intrigued by it, especially now in this dystopian nightmare that we live in, where the federal government stopped healthcare workers from testing for COVID when it could have been contained. And we're now experiencing one of, one of the worst outbreaks in, on, on the planet. And as a result, all of the state governments are overcorrecting by telling everyone, don't go outside, don't do anything, wear a mask. And you know, you, you, you have to listen to us or else the police are going to come and put you in a cage where you're almost assured to get COVID, wherein, which means the implicit threat from the state is do whatever we say, or we will infect you. Everyone is getting this. And all they need is someone to actually get in front of them and say, stop paying attention to the Republicans and Democrats. Look at me. I'm here explaining to you why this is all happening and that it's not just the Republicrats. It's the very nature of the structure of the organization that is doing this to us. It's the and entire is the alternative. Yeah. And I, th I don't think people realize that this is people. Libertarians even fall into this populist idea of a top down system where everything's controlled from the top and, the, you know, they're going to enslave us in a neo uh, fascist state. Right. You know, the, the reality is this is a bottom up system. And so, you know, when the governor of Wisconsin says, and I quote, we're the Wild West, you know, after they got their all their restrictions canceled by the Supreme Court, by the Supreme he Court yeah. the authority, he said, we're the Wild West. There are no restrictions at all across the state of Wisconsin. OK, there's local restrictions. So at this point in time, there is nothing that's compelling people to do anything other than having chaos here. And the problem with that thinking is that he thinks that he can use his authority as governor to control people. He is literally saying, I want to compel people to behave the way that I think they ought to behave. And that if I'm not able to compel your every action, everything will fall apart and crumble and you will live in total chaos. When in reality, two months ago, people said, you know, I don't know what this is. And I'm one of these people. I don't know what this is. I don't know what's going on. I don't know how bad it's going to be. I'm going to take a beat. I'm going to work from home. I'm going to go to the grocery store once a week. I'm going to do my part to keep the hospitals. So nobody who nobody who can live will die because of hospital overflow. Right, and right, everybody right. said to themselves, the rational self-interest is to stay home. And then we sit there for two months. The hospitals don't get overflowed. The people that are passing away are people who are over 60. Who, which, who, no, we're, who we're going to get it. We're going to die anyway. Yeah. Who, you know, and that's no, I mean, nine, people over 60 make up 90 million Americans, a third of the country, basically. And so that's no small number. But at a certain point, everybody in the last month went, the rational self-interest here is to keep my business afloat, to get back to work, to t go to a park. And I'm going to take precautions to protect myself. Protect myself and my family. Yeah. Right. And the government can't handle that the, the fact that people can take care of themselves. And so then you start to see the petty tyr tyrannical little things popping up that make everybody see the system for what it is. So I totally agree with you. I mean, the, the reality is libertarians have to start acting like this is a bottom up system and encouraging people to take self ownership because pushing this idea that we live in a tyrannical state where the, the free speech of Chris and Spike on a podcast is being oppressed, even though we have, literally no government monitors trying to shut this podcast down <laughs> is just a foolish message to me when you can say to people do it yourself empower yourself get to well, work you can don't be a pussy and the victimization complex in light of the fact that there are actual people that are actually being acutely victimized is not unnoticed so right. for a bunch of largely privileged largely middle and upper middle class largely white largely males to explain how oppressed we are. And again, the state is to some degree or another oppressing everyone. But when you have people in cages because they walked across a line without government permission, when you have entire communities of people who were robbed over the course of multiple generations and are now living on state property, being fed the crumbs that were robbed of them, and you tell them, I'm being oppressed because you know, of whatever, you know, temporary or small restriction has been placed. That is the wrong way to do it. People because you who have 
positions of privilege don't like to be uncomfortable and and they don't like being told they're in positions of privilege and this is a problem right. because we're not being sjw's here we're not saying check your privilege you're not allowed to have an opinion what we are saying is have a little context here right because when i went to housing projects i had to i had to check my privilege a little when i went to housing projects to tell them you know the, the this criminal justice system is treating you poorly and you know we as libertarians are against it you know what i realized something very quickly the first couple of people were like, who are you telling? I know that. Let me tell you my, what my day was like today. And they started telling me about the number of times that, you know, they basically have these mesh protective networks. They don't even know that what, you know, they've never heard that term, but where when the police come in, they call each other and let them know uh, that, you know, the police are there. When a bunch of white libertarians showed up and knocked on doors, they called each other and people started coming out to see what was going on uh, because they didn't know if we were the police or what we were doing. And they knew that the reason they do that is, is because the police aren't there to protect them. They said, our neighborhoods aren't safe. If we call 911 for something serious, they might show up. But if, you know, just on a daily basis, they come through to make sure that if someone's mowing a lawn, they have a license. That if someone is, you know, that if, 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 you know, someone reports someone else for, you know, uh, 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 cutting hair uh, or advertising that they're cutting hair or whatever, you know, and the county sees that and sees that they don't have a, a license or, or, you know, registration for that, then someone's going to come in and check on them. They know that the police state is oppressing them. They don't need anyone to tell them that. And it took hey, me a couple of not. Uh, yeah, it's not about skin color either. People, the financial insecurity that most Americans, including myself, yep. have faced or felt or faced the prospect of over the last three months is how a large, probably 40% of this country lives. Just paycheck regarding to paycheck. Yeah. Paycheck to paycheck. There, that financial insecurity is that that anxiety is what they live with every day. Yeah. That that anxiety of not being able to go do what you want to do out of yep multiple circumstances beyond your control is how a lot of people live. And I think what people, what minorities, what people of lower incomes, what they want yeah. is to be heard. Yeah. You don't, it, 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 if you have a conversation or you talk about this stuff, it doesn't mean that you have to embrace AOC and become a, an SJW commie AOC loving libtard. Right. Right. All pe they just want to be heard. They want you to understand their situation. I, that gr sour grape eating libertarian I referenced earlier through a full on tantrum yesterday because he had to wear a mask into great clips. And so he didn't get his haircut. And what is this country coming to? And I'm just like, you're mad that you're uncomfortable. You're not mad that you're losing your freedoms because that private business that you probably were ranting about gay cakes, like that private business doesn't want you in there infecting people. And I'm sorry that yeah. you're inconvenienced that your life has to change, but that's not even tyranny. That's a, unless there's a, an actual ordinance saying you have to wear a, a mask, right. then that's a different story. If a private company or, you know, someone's in their home, if someone on their property, whether it's a business, commercial property, industrial property, or residential property, if you go on their property and they go, uh, sorry, you can't be here without a mask, you're not being oppressed. That's property rights and free association. So put on the mask or go somewhere where it's okay to put on a mask and if it were put on to not put on a mask. And if it turns out that there aren't anyone, there aren't any places that aren't going to bring you in unless you put on a mask, then maybe you should reconsider whether or not to put on a mask because that is what property rights looks like. And that's okay. Yeah. Uh, the, the hyperbole around all this, like the, the there, there's a, yeah, it's a tremendous amount of hyperbole on both on all sides. Like, yeah. you know, to stay at home or you're going to die you're wearing a mask. Is like, and, yeah. There's bodies in the streets. People are dying left and right yeah. because of unemployment. It's been two months. Nobody is starving to death in the richest country on earth. In fact, we ought everybody read enlightenment now by Steven Pinker, and you'll be much more appreciative of the time that you live in because you'll see how much like there are serious problems but yeah i, I do i don't want to say one thing uh yeah. people are not dying in the streets on mass because of unemployment but there is if this continued much longer with forced shutdowns like how they were and we're already seeing that being lifting over time so i don't think that's going to be an issue we right. would eventually see food security issues i oh, saw right. it in my area in myrtle beach which is not an incredibly uh, financially depressed area where the the places that were running food banks were being overwhelmed by people that waited in their cars for hours every day to get enough food for their family and things like that. And you keep extrapolating that out. That eventually becomes not necessarily starvation, but it does become people robbing stores and stuff like that so that they don't starve. Like it, we yeah. and 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 that can quickly 
devolve quickly. So I, I, I will say that. But no, in this immediate time, we were not at you know thousands or tens of thousands starving. We were at the point of people facing homelessness. I mean, it, it's it that can potentially become a big problem. But that's, obviously, that's they were taking it too far to an extreme. The people on the other side saying that the hospitals are going to fill up with dead people if you go outside and enjoy a barbecue with your neighbors. You know, like there's again, there's there's extremes on on all ends. I think everyone should be able to take a, a, a nuanced look at how things are uh, uh, and, and look at the data as it presents itself and, and make an informed decision. And are there going to be actors who make not the best de decisions? Yeah, but that's a better alternative than a central, essentially planned arbitrary decision being made often by people who are prone to making bad decisions and actually got the position they're in because they're good at lying and pandering and signing things off that cronies ha uh, hand them to, to sign into law. Um, that's actually worse than just allowing people to screw up or, or make the right choice themselves. Sure. The, the, the reality is that, so based on, I do a nonprofit radio show here and mm -hmm. Food, food needs doubled here in Indianapolis. So yeah. food banks, everyone I've talked to, it's double. Yeah. Su suicide hotline calls 300%. Yeah. The, you know, so there is truth in that. It's, mm -hmm. and take one red pill, not the whole bottle. And so, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that stuff, the businesses like the JC Pennies of the world, that they were going to go out of business in a downturn anyways, or, or a, a fundamental shift over the next five to 10 years to work from home or online shopping. A lot of these companies or restaurants probably wouldn't have made it through. There's one popular chain here that went under, but they were over leveraged to their eyeballs, you know? The, so, well, and there was a Fed correction that was about to happen. I mean, you, you can't continue yeah. having negative interest rates and that just, I, like there was a bubble that was gonna burst. So this just, just maybe sped it up by a year. Obviously yeah. there was some additional bad stuff that happened as a result because they were literally forcing businesses to, clo to close that wouldn't have, closed otherwise but you know so there was some suppression there in additional in addition to the actual you know correction and, and recession that yeah, happened. And so the, i think the argument is for us as libertarians and you tell me if you agree or disagree is all right yes all these things would happen there would be food it's a pandemic biology is real it's not a false construct of society right right, right. And, and a pandemic people people their rational self-interest would have changed their behavior in 2020 anyways but instead of businesses being shuttered for two months, they're closed for two weeks or three weeks, or there's more testing because it's not centralized at the CDC. Yes. You're not seeing, you know, PPP. I just saw on CNBC yesterday that businesses are not spending PPP because they aren't clear on the rules. They're totally uncertain. They don't want to be penalized for how they use the money because the government hasn't been clear on how it's been used. And then people and are getting, getting and, back to work because of unemployment. Getting exactly. So, some of them are getting pressured from factors. You're just like, they made it worse. Some of them are getting pressured by their workers not to reopen yeah. because the workers are actually doing better. I think it's unless you make like 23 bucks an hour or something, in most states you'll actually do better with the unemployment plus 600 a week. And so they don't want to go back to work. And so you have small business owners that are like, but now what am I going to do? I can't, I can't do all of this work myself and no one wants yeah. to work for me. And so, you know, it's a problem. So, you know, yes, if without the lockdowns, people would have made smart informed choices largely and slowed the spread themselves. But more importantly, I don't think we would have faced this break, this, this break, uh, breakout or this contagion as poorly as we did. We wouldn't have, if the government hadn't been for the first six to eight weeks, effectively barring testing. The CDC <laughs> told doctors, you cannot test for this unless you go through the Byzantine process of approval that takes four to six months to get approval. Thankfully, there was a handful of doctors whose Hippocratic Oath mattered more than the magic piece of paper that had that particular regulation on it. And they said, no, I have patients coming in that had been to Wuhan, China and have these symptoms. And I'm going to make the test, which are apparently easy to make if you know how to do it. They made the test. They tested them. It came back positive. They went to the CDC and said, listen, there are positive test results and you need to, you know, you need to let us start doing something. And you know what the CDC initially said? That's great. Destroy all of those test results. Don't tell anyone about it, including the people who tested positive. Don't tell them they're positive. Right. Thankfully, those doctors again 
violated the law, the regulations, and put their Hippocratic oath above that of the, the above the importance of the, the regulation, and they released it to the public. So there's an example of civil disobedience forcing the government's hand because then the CDC said, oh, okay, fine, you can test. You still have to go through the approval pro process, but you can go ahead and 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 uh, provisionally test in the meantime until the you know until sometime this summer when we actually approve it. Well, you can go ahead and start testing. But you know what they're not still allowing? At home tests. You know why? Because they don't report to the government. They don't care if you know if you have the disease or not. They care if they know if you have the disease or not. And right. so because they're such control freaks that they want you, they would rather you they would rather no one know if you have it or not, or if you have the antibodies or not, which means if we get enough people to have the antibodies, which means they won't get they probably won't get reinfected, we can actually go back to living a regular life because we have herd immunity. They'd rather, if if they can't know, they don't want anyone to know. Do you know how much easier we would know whether we had herd immunity or individual people would be able to know whether they already whether they have it and so stay inside or they don't have it, so just continue taking precautions or they already had it, they have the antibodies so they can take fewer pre precautions while they're out. Do you know how much easier life would be if we had that? And do and you know how much easier it would be if this thing wasn't such a, a, an outbreak to begin with because they had been able to contain it earlier on? All of these things are not being allowed because of the government. The government will not protect you. The government will make you less safe. And now the government, again, is saying, if you don't listen to us, we will put you in jails where you are almost certain to get infected. In other words, they're saying, we will not keep you safe. We created this problem. And if you don't listen to what we have to say, we will infect you with this disease that we told you is so serious. That is the underlying message of what libertarians call in our statement of principles, the cult of the omnipotent state. It is the idea that government is so overpowering and so all knowing and so all powerful that you simply have to listen to them or they can use whatever level of harm they deem fit to bring you into compliance, even if that compliance is you being dead. That is the cult of the omnipotent state. We need to challenge it at every single step. And we're not going to be able to do that until we change the cultural conversation. We're not going to win politics, which is downstream of culture, until we win culturally. And we're not going to win culturally until we get in front of them and explain what it is we have to say. That is why I support Vermin Supreme. That is why we are doing this. That is why we are affecting the greater culture is because people need to hear this. And they're not going to hear it from someone who looks, acts, and presents themselves like just another politician. They never will do it because they have been conditioned to believe that politicians will lie to you. That is why 46% of voters, eligible voters, did not vote in 2016 because they knew deep down what we all know to be true. If you vote for a Republican or a Democrat, it doesn't matter. It, they are going to lie to you and it's a waste of time. You might as well do something else on a Tuesday. You might as well just go to work and make some extra money or go, if it's in the evening, go and see a movie or something. It'll be a better use of your time than voting for a Republican or a Democrat. They're already halfway there. They get it. These are the people that we can reach. The people who hold their noses and vote Republican because they're slightly better than Democrats or vote Democrat because they're slightly better than Republicans. These are the people that we can reach. And we have to, the only way you can do it is if they know you exist. That is the purpose of Vermin Supreme. That is the purpose of me. That is what we are doing. We are boot pilling people. We are bringing, we are bringing more people to the Libertarian Party than anyone else. And we will continue to do so because our way works. Nonlinear messaging, it, bringing things together in a humorous way, making people want to hear what you have to say, making people enjoy it and be entertained by it and want to hear more and have their defenses lowered and be completely engaged. That is how you bring people into it. All right. Well, <clears throat> you see why uh, he is gaining in popularity. Spike Cohn, it was great to talk to you today, and I wish yeah. you the best of luck in your contest. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. And uh, guys, if you want to find out more about us, uh, VermintSupreme2020.com. Uh, we also have a new website, inonthejoke.net. So if you like the joke, but you want to hear more serious stuff about what we actually propose in terms of policy, inonthejoke.net is a completely serious policy platform. Uh, and we are building on that. We're about to be adding our new plank on common sense police control for the children. And uh, uh, But we have stuff on there about everything from immigration to climate change to war to the war on drugs to sex work and everything in between. Uh, if you want to see me on social media, right over here. Uh, on Twitter at real, I've gotten good at doing this. Uh, Twitter at real Spike Cohen, Facebook, uh, Facebook.com slash literally Spike Cohen, or uh, you can type in 
uh, if you're in the Facebook search bar, it's Spike Cohen, your next VP. And uh, I would be happy to hear from you. If you want to buy some merch, uh, you can go to vermintsupreme2020.com and go to our store. If you want to donate, we'll take crypto. We can take your crypto. Give us some of that Bitcoin you've been hodling. Um, and uh, we would love to hear from you. We'd love for you to join our team. If you are a delegate, I want you to know that I love you more than I've loved anyone else in my entire life. And I I promise you that is not a pander. Um, no, seriously, if you're a delegate, feel free to reach out to me. If you have any questions, I would love to answer them for you. I hope to have your support. Uh, we want to grow this party. We want to grow this movement. We want to start affecting change at the cultural level, at the public level, change the needle away from the ever-growing state, ever-growing government, ever-growing control in every aspect of your lives and towards people questioning whether we even need a government. And if we do, what should it even be involved in? You know, what, what things should it be involved in versus what can we do for ourselves and in cooperation with others? And I encourage you to, to join us in doing that. Thank you. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks, Spike, for joining me. And we will talk to you soon. Thank you so much.